thank you everyone for coming at this uh, late hour uh, on a work day. Uh, I am just starting my fourth month in Qatar, so I'm fairly new to the community, but I'm not new to this particular area. Uh, I've been involved in startup activities for about 25 years. Uh, in the course of my career, I've been involved in helping start 20 companies, uh, primarily from a legal perspective, but also involved in raising monies and that sort of thing. Uh, typically, when uh, folks are speaking to a room of digital entrepreneurs, if anyone's wearing a suit, they're either an account executive in a large company or a lawyer. So I'm going to be playing the lawyer tonight. Uh, and I'm going to be talking about uh, a subject that at its core is very broad, very complex, and it's going, it would be very difficult in just 30 minutes to really dive into the subject matter uh, in any great depth. So I'm going to pretend to be sort of a falcon flying very high in the air. I'm going to kind of swoop down and attack a prey, you know, some subjects. Uh, and I'm going to focus on subjects that are of particular uh, interest, I hope, to uh, digital entrepreneurs. Uh, and you, you will see them as I proceed through my presentation. Uh, one of the questions that I'm often asked is, how do I define entrepreneurship? And I've spent a lot of my career working with medical centers like Sidra, but I've also worked in, in software companies in the digital world. And it's been my experience that entrepreneurship really is a state of mind. It's kind of a feeling, a thing that you do. And it's built on the desire to serve the greater good, and I would say the greater good of humanity. But it's fueled by a sense of wonder and a sense of urgency. A sense of wonder in the sense that technology is fascinating and things are moving very fast in the world. But there's also a sense of urgency. We need to do things now. Uh, this is particularly uh, the case in an academic medical center setting. There is really a sense of urgency for the development of new technologies to help patients. Now, if you consider that a sense of wonder, sometimes maybe you think of that as, as children. But in adults, that equates to passionate curiosity about technology. Uh, the famous physicist Albert Einstein once said, I have no special gifts, I am just passionately curious. And unlike Albert Einstein, I think you all have uh, special gifts and you're also passionately curious. So that is how I define entrepreneurship uh, in my experience. Now, I'm going to be talking primarily about the Internet of Things very broadly and how at certain at uh, points it connects to social media, uh, which was the focus of today's discussion. And I'm going to talk about some key legal items. First, intellectual property, data security, and data privacy. Really, those three subjects, although very, very broad, are likely in the front of everyone's mind uh, in the digital entrepreneurship world uh, for a variety of reasons, and I'll touch on a few of them. Now, copyrights are one of the intellectual properties, and there are others that you certainly are familiar with, trade secrets, trademarks, patents. And I put them in this particular order because those of you who work in the digital field will likely interface with these types of legal protections, likely in this order. Copyrights, because they come into being automatically. Uh, you don't really have to do anything. You just have them. Uh, trade secrets, which is confidential information. Everyone works with confidential information. Uh, a little bit more formalistic, you get to trademarks, which identify goods. And then finally, patents uh, are an entirely different area of complexity that is constantly changing. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time with patents uh, because of time constraints. Uh, but I'm going to focus my, my talk on kind of a basic understanding of these types of intellectual properties very quickly, so we're all uh, have a common understanding, and then I'll talk about some more specific issues. Now, copyrights protect original expression of an idea that's fixed in a tangible medium of expression. Now, if you notice in the common definition of copyrights, expression appears twice. So expression is important. It's how things are expressed. 
Now, when someone says, I have a copyright, what does that mean exactly, I have a copyright? Well, copyright is really a bundle of rights. A copyright gives you the ability to reproduce a work, the ability to adapt a work, which we call creation of derivative works. You have the right to distribute the copyrighted work. You can display it, and you can perform it. So when someone says, I have a copyright, they have this list of rights that they could utilize in their activities. Now, in the digital world, copyrights last a very, very long time. Uh, in most instances, it's the life of the author plus 70 years. Uh, in an employment context, that could be as long as 100 years. That's like a million years in the digital world. So it lasts a very long time, essentially forever, if you're thinking of it in those terms. Now, trade secrets are really anything that is kept confidential, but that can provide the owner of that information with a competitive business advantage. And you can imagine a lot of different types of information that would fall into that category. Lists of customers, ways of doing business, source code for your programs, for instance. And if you maintain them, if you keep them secret, they could possibly last forever. Uh, however, the challenge is keeping them secret. How about trademarks? A trademark simply identifies a product and it distinguishes it from other products, you know, Microsoft versus Apple or Samsung versus Nokia. And the core idea is that it's identifying the source. So when you see the Apple logo, you know it's from Apple or you know it's from Microsoft if it's a Microsoft logo. And like trade secrets, if you maintain them appropriately, and that's essentially paying money to keep them going uh, with the various uh, offices that maintain trademarks, they could really last forever if you want them to. Now, patents are a little bit different in that if you notice in my first sentence, I say the patents are used to prevent others from doing something. You can prevent others from making, using, or selling. One of the things that folks don't realize often about patents is having a patent doesn't necessarily mean that you can practice your patent, right? You can prevent others from practicing it, but you may not be able to practice it. You may need a license for, say, background art or competing uh, technologies or other technologies. So it, it's a, a little different than the other areas of intellectual property. And patents are only good or only valid out to the borders of the country in which they were filed. So you have a US patent and you have a European patent, you have an Australian patent, uh, and so on. Uh, most patents will last 20 years from the date of their filing, so they're not essentially forever, like perhaps copyrights or trademarks or trade secrets. Uh, they do have a finite life. Now, just as a summary, copyrights protect the form of expression of the ideas. Remember, expression is, is the key. Trademarks protect the identification of the sources of these ideas. And patents and trademarks protect the application of the ideas. So you, uh, I think hopefully we're all on the, a common understanding about intellectual property. Now. Let's talk about a hot legal issue, and this is becoming more and more prevalent uh, from a litigation point of view and from a strategic management point of view, and that's the use of free and open source software, and I abbreviated it FOSS, which I think is what you folks call it. And because of the prevalence of free and open source uh, software in the marketplace, uh, there is sort of becoming a situation where a FOSS uh, is starting to give rise to litigation. Well, how can that be? When people see the word free, they think unfettered, right? It's free from perhaps a, a money point of view. You're not paying for the software. But underlying it, remember we talked about all of these copyrights and all this other stuff kind of existing that is not free. 
from, from the perspective of obligation. So what is happening is that technologies are being developed and they are incorporating FOSS into their products. And as they are marketing them, they are what? Infringing the copyright of the FOSS holder. And there has been litigations, particularly in the United States, that have resulted in very, very large damages. Uh, so the whole issue of what do you do with free and open source software if you are utilizing it in your products. Now, if you are a digital company and you are distributing a software product, you definitely want to identify the presence of FOSS within your product. You want to be able to manage how it's utilized. And if there are licenses attached to that free and open source software, you want to make sure that you're complying with it. Because if you're going to be marketing a product, those obligations flow through to whatever license you are granting to your uh, customers. So hence, it's really about the obligation flow through to other users that you have to be concerned about. Now, what if you're using it simply within your company for specific purposes? It's more an issue of compliance. Uh, there are probably restrictions associated with the use of that uh, technology as far as propagation and distribution, and you need to be aware of them. Now, a lot of software is available under what they call public licenses, but if you, you read through all of the verbiage, the legal verbiage of these licenses, they'll, there's usually a section that talks about potential commercial use. So if you are a commercial company, you have to pay particular attention to those uh, particular clauses because they are likely to be restrictive and you have to be aware of them. So identifying and managing and then complying I think is the key when it comes to uh, free and open source software. Uh, it's kind of interesting because when I, way back when, when I was young and software was you know, very new, uh, sort of everything was proprietary at that point. It was only much later in the process that this free and open source software came into being. And there's also, in some instances, been kind of a cycling of it. Uh, there was a time when Linux was you know, uh, competing with Unix, and then along came Red Hat, if you've heard of the company Red Hat. So they're taking Linux and they're making money from Linux, which is a free and open source software. So there's, there's kind of this recycling of ideas along the way. And I think it's likely going to accelerate. Now, I had mentioned the basis of copyright and how does that kind of impact on FOSS? Why should you be concerned about it? If you think you link back to the bundle of rights, what would you be doing with that software in your own product? Well, you would likely be reproducing it. You could be adapting it, creating a derivative work, or distributing it. So you would have impacted those, at least those three of the bundle of rights of copyright. That's why you need to be uh, thinking about it. Now, I spoke to uh, some of the, the programmers at Sidra, and I asked about this because that's what I need to do as the council. You know, how do you find out whether or not this software is embedded in what you're using? And they gave me these names. So maybe you are familiar with them uh, as tools to scan your programs to see if there's FOSS included. Now another subject that is particularly important for social media based uh, companies, but probably all companies that deal with digital information, is the idea of data security. Now the interconnectedness of the Internet of Things, and if you think about all the things that are being connected now, you know, scannables and wearables and Anything that you attach the word smart to, you know, is sending information someplace and you're being tracked and all that information is being generated. So things are connecting things all over and that information has value to someone uh, or a lot of folks. So as a part of your plan, your uh, development of your products or your company, you need to come up with a way to ensure that there is security in this information. And I've termed it security by design. You really have to think about security from the very beginning uh, of developing the technology. Now, what are the key issues as far as data security? Well, connecting intelligently, for one. Every, is it really necessary for 
say, my device to connect it to this device or that device? You know, should your phone connect to your refrigerator? Is there a reason for that? Maybe there is, maybe there isn't. But if it does connect, it's going to have an impact. Uh, ensuring that the software remains up to date over its life. Uh, there are certainly issues in the area of medical applications of social media where keeping things up to date is absolutely critical. And finally, maximizing data protection as a part of your overall security plan. And obviously that's a technological type of activity, but it has to be a part of your strategy as well. Now, the last issue I wanted to raise is data privacy. And I contrast data security, which I view more as a technological process. But data privacy is kind of a a business strategy. You choose what information that you want to gather from your customers as a part of your business plan. Now, obviously this information is going to have value. You know, knowledge is power. Knowledge is value. And there's going to be lots and lots of uh, individuals and companies that want to have access. Now, the key is to, to approach this issue very proactively. Uh, you want to approach privacy of data, and I've kind of focused it more, it's, it's not as much data, is it? It's really about privacy of the user. So there, there, there is a person behind that information. So really when you're protecting data, you're protecting people, protecting individuals. Uh, think of it that way. Now, uh, there's been a lot of talk about a, uh, a way of doing this called data minimization. It's essentially only collecting as much information as you need to fulfill the, uh, the purposes of what your program is going to do. Uh, and you'll only keep that information for as long as you need to keep it. Uh, in the medical application area, this is a significant issue because you, you are collecting information about a person's health. Now, what happens if that information is kept forever and ever someplace, you know, in the cloud or where it might be? Uh, and someone could get to it. You know, someone could break the security and get to that medical information. It could be very difficult and very challenging. So kind of minimizing the danger, you know, the impact of a security breach by only collecting as much information as you need to collect to do what you want to do. Uh, my employer requires me to say that I am not authorized to practice law in Qatar. So I can't provide legal advice to you related to private matters. A lot of times when I give talks, I get calls uh, afterwards, and I get very, very detailed hypothetical situations that people talk about. Uh, I, and I know it's coming because that's how they start. Hypothetically, if this, so. But I'm, I'm happy to uh, talk about these topics in general uh, particularly from uh, a legal perspective, uh, especially intellectual property, it's kind of my area. So, thank you. Yeah. Well, thanks.